one to take to Jim Loeb. Hi, Jim. Veteran neocon watcher and long-standing opponent of anti-Semitism. I, I was sitting in a bar in Capitol Hill and I was told by a congressional staffer, careful how you use the word neoconservative. People might think you're being anti-Semitic. Can you just explain this for me? I mean, it's no secret. The majority of neoconservatives have been and remain Jewish. That is a fact. They, are not, they do not represent a majority of the American Jewish community. But you think it's legitimate to talk about the pro-Israeli politics of some of the neoconservatives? Well, I think it's very difficult to understand them if you don't begin at that point. I mean, I should think people would want to talk about that rather openly, because to the extent that you suppress it, and I think there is an attempt by some to suppress it, I think then it festers. In 1996, a group of neocons wrote a report intended as advice for incoming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It called for a clean break with the peace process, rolling back Syria and removing Saddam Hussein from power, an important Israeli strategic objective in its own right. Amongst those who contributed, Richard Pearl, Douglas Fife, now number three at the Pentagon, David Wormser, now in the State Department, and Mayrav Wormser. It was no more than a mental exercise done in a think tank um, uh, by a group of people. Um, yes, many of us are Jewish. There's no need to apologize for that. Um, uh, most of us, all of us, in fact, are pro-Israel. Uh, some of us more fiercely so than, the, than, than others. But we have no problem also criticizing Israel. That, that paper in 1996, the, the Clean Break paper, that was the paper that led to accusations of, of dual loyalty. There is no dual loyalty. Uh, the people in the group are Americans, first and foremost, um, and uh, view themselves as American thinkers and as people who are most interested in American policy. We see a tremendous... Uh, similarity um, between Israel and America, and Britain for that matter, uh, simply because these are leading democracies. In the case of Israel, it's the only democracy in the Middle East. Live from the front line. On TV, signs the advance is slowing. Charges of dual loyalty touch on raw emotions. Professor Elliot Cohen is one of America's top military historians. We met as the progress of the war seemed in the balance. In a narrow military sense, the achievements look you know, pretty remarkable. Uh, you know, 50 miles outside Baghdad, a lot of bad things that could have happened haven't happened yet. Professor Cohen is also an advisor to the Pentagon and has been involved with both the AEI and the project for the new American century. You've expressed some concern over the idea that this is all a conspiracy whipped up by a group of, quotes, neoconservative hawks who are somehow allied to Israel, and you've expressed well, worries about that. Ex explain what you're concerned about. Look, sometimes the word neoconservative is used when what they really would like to say is Jew. They being? People who use that kind of language. And as a Jew, I found it offensive. There are two things that are um, despicable about it. The first is the imputation of dual loyalties. Um, Between America and Israel. Right. Uh, and and just time. speaking as somebody whose father served in the United States Army, who served in the United States Army himself, who was the son serving in the United States Army, I find it deeply, deeply offensive yes. and untrue. And the other thing that I find deeply offensive about it is it contains a very old anti-Semitic canard, which is that the Jews, this scattered little people around the world have these occult powers and are pulling the strings of the naive and duped non-Jews. And it wasn't long, that long ago that those kinds of beliefs led to hideous things which impinged upon people like me very directly. So yes, I feel very strongly about it. Iraq will be disarmed. The Iraqi regime will be ended, and the long-suffering Iraqi people will be free. In decades of oppression, the Iraqi regime has sought to... Same soundbite from the president, but today a chance for Tony Blair to make the TV headlines in America. There is a massive amount that has already been achieved. Do you think Tony Blair has anything in common with neoconservatives? 
I, I think Tony Blair's uh, um, moral sense is uh, very much reflected in the thinking of many neoconservatives. I, I suppose he'd be horrified to hear that, especially since the term neoconservative is uh, uh, so abused. But uh, his sense that it was right to liberate uh, Iraq is the sense of neoconservatives and was not the view of uh, uh, most foreign offices, including probably his own. The justice of our cause lies in the liberation of the Iraqi people. And to them we say, we will liberate you. The day of your freedom draws near. It's very nice to sit around and say, we're in Europe and we believe in the rule of law and we believe in the United Nations. But Saddam Hussein is there and he's a dictator and he has weapons of mass destruction. And are you going to do something about it or not? And insofar as Tony Blair's answer was yes. And insofar as Tony Blair's answer was yes, even if the rest of the UN Security Council doesn't agree with us, I think Tony Blair is a kind of uh, neoconservative despite himself. Many mental health experts believe following round-the-clock coverage of the war could be hazardous to your health. Opposition stronger than expected. The U.S. prepares for a longer war. Ten days in, America's patriotic TV channels are worrying about a longer war. Bad news for the neoconservatives, who help make out the case for the conflict. The story that I just wrote said, neocon nosedive, with a question mark. Neocon nosedive? Uh, yeah. It has a certain alliteration. <laughs> Don't tell me why. Tell me why. Well, because again, they're the ones who said, essentially, this would be a cakewalk, this would be easy. We'd see tens of thousands of uh, Iraqi soldiers surrendering. We'd see people rising up all over the place in joy to, to greet you know, their liberators and so on. And we haven't seen it yet. On Fox TV, where neocon Bill Crystal is a pundit, it all looks different. Fox has the most cheerleading tone. They're doing fine, Linda, and, you know, the media does not reflect the country. Some people in Washington are saying this is a neoconservative war, and so far there's no sign it's working, the regime isn't, isn't crumbling. What do you say? I'd say it's an American war. Like Bill Crystal's magazine, Fox TV is part of Rupert Murdoch's media empire. The neocons have been backed by entrepreneurs, corporations, and rich right-wing foundations, which has led some to claim they're being used to export not democracy, but capitalism. Some people say, look, um, neoconservative ideology, fine, but what you're really doing is making the world safe for capitalism. You know, you're backed by Mr. Murdoch, Fox TV. Um, front for capitalism? No, I mean, not in my case. I'm much more interested in liberty and democracy than I am in capitalism. Yeah, I was once a social democrat, sort of, and I had, no, oh, look, social democracy is fine. It's about freedom and liberty, freedom and democracy. It's not about capitalism. Back in the 60s, Joshua Moravchek of the American Enterprise Institute was even further to the left. It was the journey people like him made to the political right that earned them the label new or neoconservatives, intended as an insult, but one they took up as a badge of honor. Old political loyalties to Democrat colleagues of the past still linger. Like Richard Pearl, Joshua Moravchek is still a Democrat. I think it's very relevant that uh Virtually all neoconservatives come out of the left, some the liberal left, some the radical left, as I myself uh, did. I grew up in the civil rights movement fighting against uh, discrimination and, and, and segregation. And uh, I think I brought some of that same spirit to fighting against communism when I came to the view that that was uh, the world's uh, chief chief evil and uh, today to fighting against uh, terrorism and uh, Islamic extremism. Uh, and I think it also, it, it, it gives us a certain uh, uh, flair for the ideological uh, battle. We, we're not unhappy with it. We want to take on our opponents. Tonight, how the day unfolded... On TV, the more skeptical newscasts are talking of a quagmire. Today. What do you think of that? Is that a great that toe? Ring? That's my selfie. <laughs> I'm going to get a monkey to go with it. Hello? Yes? Richard Pearl's in a Washington studio for that Sunday's panorama. His good humor belies the fact there's more yeah. bad news for the neocon cause. He's just resigned as chairman of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board, though he's still a member. There have been allegations of a conflict of interest over a business deal, charges he strongly rejects. I'm joined from Washington by Richard Pearl, the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense. 
who's been described by some newspapers as the architect of the Iraq war. What will happen if at the end of the war the Americans do not find any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Well, I believe that the liberation of Iraq, the freeing of the Iraqi people, uh, would be justification enough. How did you feel about being called the architect of the war? Well, I, I, I mean, there's hardly a point in denying it. It isn't true, of course, but... And as far as the planning is concerned, I had nothing whatever to do with that. Nothing. Do you think the influence of the new conservatives in the Pentagon is going to be weakened by resignation? At all. Certainly hope not. The Pentagon, the Pentagon is in good hands. And that will be evident when this is over. I think it's evident already, but it will certainly be evident when it's over.